Physicists love to use diagrams to get a clear picture of what's happening in a problem. Graphs are a great way of visualizing different concepts. Remember our old friends velocity and acceleration? Let's look at how they affect each other across three different graphs. These are three graphs showing the same information about how a car moves with constant acceleration. From them you can see the relationship between distance, velocity and acceleration. The first graph is distance versus time, the second is velocity versus time, and the third is acceleration versus time. The green line shows that the car is stationary. In other words, it's not moving forward or backwards, it's perfectly still. We know this because as time moves forward, the distance of the car doesn't change. The red lines show a constant speed forward and a constant speed backward. In the first graph, the distance that the car is moving increases or decreases linearly. In the graph of velocity, we see that the velocity is unchanging or constant. When the car is moving forward, the gradient is positive. Finally, the yellow lines show acceleration and deceleration. These are the hardest ideas for students everywhere to understand. The first line is arcing upwards. This shows acceleration because as time moves forward, the distance increases at an increasing rate, as in the line is constantly getting steeper and steeper. Here the same thing happens with deceleration. In the velocity graph, the line for acceleration increases linearly. In the acceleration graph, we again see that acceleration is constant, and deceleration is also constant, just negative. Now that we've got a grasp on our old friends velocity and acceleration, it's time to talk about kinematics. We sometimes have problems involving constant acceleration, where we're given several pieces of different information. Thankfully, some clever folk devised these four incredible kinematics equations that you're free to use as much as you want. Here they are. Here d is the distance the object is moved. vi is the initial velocity of the object. vf is the final velocity of the object. A is the acceleration of the object, which will be constant, and T is the travel time of the object. Basically, if you're asked any horrible looking questions about objects in motion, you can look to these equations as your saving grace. Just pick the one that suits you best, input the numbers you're given, and wait and see what pops out the other end. Let's look at an example. You stand on a bridge over a river and drop a stone into the water. The bridge is six meters high. How fast is the stone going to be going when it hits the water? This might seem horrible, because it looks like we've only been given one piece of information to help us out, which is the distance, 6 metres. Actually though, we've got a whole lot of other clues, like the initial speed of the stone has to be zero because it's dropped, right? It's not thrown. The acceleration of the stone is just the constant acceleration of gravity, and that's just 9.8 metres per second per second. So all in all, we know the initial velocity, the distance, and the constant acceleration, and we want to figure out the final velocity. We just pick the best equation, which is going to be this one. It's even been arranged nicely for us. We stick in our numbers like so, and do some solving, then we get rid of the square with a square root. And there, boys and girls, is the answer. The final velocity is 10.8 meters per second. Objects flying through the air leads us into projectile motion. As soon as you launch an object into the air, it becomes a projectile, and fittingly, it enters a very special kind of motion called projectile motion. The biggest idea of projectile motion is also the one that almost everyone struggles to grasp. The only force acting on the object is the force of gravity. That's it, there's nothing else. Gravity causes objects to accelerate downwards at a rate of 9.8 meters per second per second. Remember how we broke force vectors into horizontal and vertical components? We do the exact same thing in projectile motion with an object's velocity. Imagine that a cannonball has been fired horizontally off a cliff. The cannonball's overall motion is going to be made up of a horizontal part and a vertical part. The vertical velocity of the cannonball is going to be constantly decreasing because of the downwards acceleration of gravity. But what about the horizontal part? If the cannonball starts out with a velocity to the right of 20 meters per second, then that isn't going to change, because there's no horizontal force acting against it. 
we only have gravity to worry about, and gravity is vertical. So the cannonball starts out moving only to the right at 20 meters per second. Then pretty quickly, because of gravity, it gets pulled down faster and faster every second. But as for that horizontal 20 meters per second, well, that just doesn't change. We can put all of these ideas together and solve a question about projectile motion. Let's say that you chuck a ball upwards with a vertical velocity of 2 meters per second while you're lying down on the ground. The motion of the ball can be broken down into horizontal and vertical parts. What we're trying to find out is how long it takes before the ball gets brought back down to earth by gravity. Keep in mind that it's going to start out moving upwards before it gets pulled down again. So how can we solve this problem? In fact, we get to ignore the horizontal motion of the ball. The only thing we actually care about is the vertical part. We want to start out by looking at how long it will be moving up for. Here's what we know so far. The initial velocity of the ball, upwards, is 2 meters per second. Just at the moment the ball reaches the top of its height, the final velocity will be zero. Since the velocity is initially upwards, or positive, and we know it ends up downwards, or negative, we can figure out that since the velocity is becoming less and less positive and more and more negative, there must be a point when it's at zero. This occurs at the peak of the flight, or just before the ball starts to fall downwards. There's a constant acceleration of 9.8 meters per second downwards because of gravity. That means the acceleration will be negative. There's a kinematics equation we can use to find the time it takes. Final velocity equals the initial velocity plus acceleration times time. All we do is stick in those numbers in the right places, then we solve for t. Right, so it'll be 0.2 seconds before the ball gets to the peak. We can simply double this to figure out the overall time it'll spend in the air, which will be 0.4 seconds. Easy. Remember, a constant velocity means zero acceleration. View velocity and acceleration in terms of their horizontal and vertical components. Ask yourself what information you have about the problem. Chances are there's a kinematic equation that will help you out.